Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to another episode of Everything Astronomy. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to Alexandra Wormley, or Alex Wormley, a Michigan grad. At Michigan, she studied history and psychology and was a president of the Student Astronomical Society because of her interest in the field of space psychology. She's now a graduate student at Arizona State University studying social psychology. Her research focuses on how our environment influences individuals and cultures. Thank you for talking to us. We're really excited. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and geeking out a little bit more. Awesome. Well, so we thought that um, as an interesting first question, we would talk about the cultural significance of astronomical observations because you were interested in that as an undergrad. So what, in your opinion, do you think is the most significant astronomical observation in terms of its impact on a culture or a civilization? And or maybe is, it, is that still to come? Well, I think the obvious thing is if we ever discover alien life, either intelligent or not elsewhere in the universe, I think it's really going to be a game changer for human civilization, at least how we think about ourselves. Um, but in terms of what has happened in the past, at least my favorite example, and if you've ever heard me give a planetarium show, I'm sure you've heard of this, um, is the Crab Nebula supernova in 1054 um, CE. So it happens, they spot it, I think it's like July 2nd, July 12th, something like that. And all of a sudden they see this super bright red light in the sky and it's going for like two weeks, three weeks, it's visible in the sky. You could still see it during the day, even years later. And within a few days, the Catholic Church breaks off from the Eastern Orthodox Church. So we have what's called the Great Schism in history. And I just like to put myself in the shoes of the people that were really into the church at that time. So you see this crazy demonic looking red light up in the sky. And then all of a sudden the church breaks apart um, and really dramatically affects um, the relationship between Western and Eastern Europe for the next thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, just recently, were, were the two churches able to even sit down together to have a conversation? So how ominous that must have been at the time for people is something that I think is really interesting. Maybe Noah D put the two things together and I'm just imagining it, but the Catholic Church actually was really into astronomical observations. They get a bad rap because Galileo, they were in the wrong there. I'm going to give them that. But they actually invested a lot of money in astronomy because it helped them um, know when certain people holidays were going to happen. So by tracking the stars, that was really important to them. And they actually still sponsor an observatory here in Arizona, I believe. It's yep, it's called, it's uh, Latin for the devil, I believe actually. And so the, the postdoc I worked with freshman year at the university through the astronomy department, uh, uh, he then went back to the Vatican to, to work for them. I think they have maybe nine or 10 astronomers on their staff. But it's pretty interesting that uh, to think how, like, he's a, he's a Jesuit priest, but he's also a professional astronomer and went to school for astrophysics. So it's, it's quite interesting how that can be. Yeah, like you, you don't think about that because I feel like in, you know, middle school and high school science classes, they have to kind of boil things down and what they boil it down to is the Catholic churches against science. But and astronomy especially, but they really aren't. Like, they still invest quite a bit of money and sponsor um, this sort of science because it does matter to them. Mm -hmm. And so um, that it's, it's really crazy to think that what people see in the sky kind of puts you in your place. And that definitely that was the case with the Catholic Church because when you're told that you are not the center of the universe, which is what you told people and that you really believed for a, th a thousand years, that's definitely kind of a tough one. But do you think then that if we meet aliens, that do you think that would be, how do you think that would be received by different people? And for, surely as well, the way that we run into them is going to be, is going to have a huge impact on that. Because in some sense, I we were kind of having run-ins with that idea already. We had a couple of weeks ago, the Venus 
or maybe a month ago, the whole idea that maybe Venus was hosting alien life. And all, all, they're always hypotheticals, but I feel like they're kind of warming the room to the idea of having aliens. So what do you think that would look like if we all of a sudden discovered aliens? Yeah, so my advisor in my lab here at ASU, we've actually, they have actually looked at this a little bit as a part of ASU's interplanetary initiative. Um, and so what they did was they showed people news articles about um, finding alien life. They manipulated it a little bit, you know, like, oh, it was like microbial life or no, it was sentient life. Um, and they found that people were actually pretty enthusiastic about the idea. So they had this viewpoint that was more about, well, here's all the good things that could come out of alien life. You know, maybe we trade technology with them, we trade ideas, and we get all this new innovation out of it. So they weren't as concerned about the risks. Um, but another thing to note is that people in this study actually thought that they had more of a positive view than the rest of humanity would. So what they're saying there is like, I'm really enthusiastic about the idea of receiving aliens. I think it'll be a good thing, but like everybody else might not have the same viewpoint as me. Um, that's kind of a common thing that we do. We sometimes believe that our opinions are more extreme or other people's opinions are more extreme depending on the context. Um, I think that these findings though, and, and they do note this, are people's you know, you're sitting in front of a computer screen reading an article, fake or not. But when we would actually be confronted with the reality of there's this strange thing that just landed on Earth and we don't know anything about it, I don't think we're going to react as positively as we think we are. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason I think this is because of research on prejudice. You know, humans sometimes, oftentimes, are really afraid of the unknown. Um, Think about, you know, the racial issues we've seen just in America in the last few months. Um, so the idea that we would just magically get along with some sentient alien life because of the promise and opportunities they bring doesn't really add up, at least to me. Uh, I want to uh, think that we'd have a positive viewpoint, but I think we're more likely to go to nuclear war before we're going to sit down and have a productive conversation if something's flying towards us. I, I was going to say, who, whoever finds whom first is going to have a huge impact on mm -hmm. that, because if we find them and they have no way of coming to us, that's, that's definitely one thing. And for, speaking for myself, that would be really exciting. However, if one day they just land here and show up and say, hi, what's up? I, I could see how that would create the, uh, the, how that would create room for a lot of fear and unhappiness. And for this study out of Arizona State, was this based just on US citizens that you gathered in like the Arizona area? Or, cause I'm curious to know how much of an effect pop culture and like people growing up with science fiction movies and whether they're, you know, whether or not they saw E.T. or if they saw Predator and maybe that, that how that impacts uh, how they respond to your questionnaires. That's a really good point. So uh, another thing they did, and again, this is mostly looking at U.S. news articles, was the valence of words used in news articles. So they did um, more of like a linguistic analysis on news articles. They found the same thing, people tend to be positively biased. Another thing we have talked about doing now is looking at a cross-cultural sample, um, especially looking at maybe Japan or South Korea, where they still have the pop culture influence of aliens, but it's kind of a drastically, dif not drastically different, but a fairly different culture from that of what we see in the U.S. I'd be inclined to agree with you, Michael. Um, it's about what is your, what is your influence been so far? Um, have you taken a class on aliens like I have where you realize the odds of this happening at all are pretty slim so what does it matter in the first place or was your first exposure to aliens ET or was it predator it's probably going to have an impact um, based on how you learned about this concept and how it initially formed in your head but again the templates we have in our evolved brain is like if this thing is new and unfamiliar and poses any sort of threat I should probably be more wary of it than I should be embracing. Yeah, because I mean, America is also inherit because of its the, the the history of its making has inherited more of a pioneering attitude attitude towards new things and new and new places a lot. Well, and a lot more so than, for example, you could, you would find in Europe, where which didn't move when they had the well because the people who 
are still there, the people who didn't move when they could have kind of early on. And so I imagine that people, that it would, there would be a really big impact on how much, if you would see that as an opportunity or a threat to your lifestyle and your, your well being. That's an interesting point that you could almost look at like, how open are you to new experiences? That's like a personality trait that's commonly measured. One of the things our lab often controls for when we're thinking about things is how many immigrants um, do you have in that particular culture? Because if you are often operating in an environment where you're interacting with people you're unfamiliar with, if there's a lot of exchange of cultural ideals, you're probably more likely to be a little bit open to those things hmm. than say in a really established community um, like Europe tends to be, where there's not a ton of immigration and migration, people tend to stay in one spot where like is, that the world that, of America. is that something that psych psychology is trying to move towards, trying to get a larger group of folks from different people? Because it seems to me that, for example, if you're in a lab at ASU, it's going to be hard to get people from Africa or from uh, South Asia or some or anywhere in, <laughs> anywhere that's not you know North America, and Conversely, is that some is that a is that a problem? Because do you think that obscure that kind of tends to obscure your view, or do you think that you actually do get a representative sample of people by just talking to a bunch of people from the same place? You absolutely don't get a representative sample, and so this is a part of a larger issue in psychology called the replication crisis, where we're realizing we're performing a lot of experiments, but when a different lab in a different state or a different country tries to replicate, most of the time, these things aren't replicating. And so one of the issues that has been identified is called the weird problem. And I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but it's something like 92% of psychological studies are done on people that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic in terms of where they live. They might not meet one of those criteria, like they might not be rich, but in terms of the global scale, they probably are more affluent. So like 92% of studies or 88% are conducted on these populations, but they represent an insanely small amount of um, the actual population of Earth, something around 10%. So a lot of our results aren't generalizable um, to the amount of scientific rigor that we'd like to have because we can run studies for free on Psychology 101 students and have results fairly quickly. There's been more push to do the um, more cross-cultural research, um, pair up with labs in other countries so that you can rerun these results, your experiments, and see if they replicate in other countries, or if they don't replicate, that's also an interesting finding. Like, why don't people, um, you know, have the same cognitive processes across um, different countries? Um, I like what I do in part because I am more so looking at cultural stuff where we look at really large data sets so that we can compare on a country level. Um, and start to look at some of those things. But it, you're definitely right. It's a huge issue in psychology. Um, Joe Heinrich just published a book on it. It's called The Weirdest People, I think it's called. Um, it just came out and it kind of goes into that, into that concept of what is weird. Yeah, because thinking back to the alien study, I imagine you mentioned perhaps expanding it out towards Japan or South Korea, but of course there's that that barrier that if you don't have someone or some like connection between a university there and here, then there's that language barrier or that accessibility barrier of like uh, getting their opinions or their um, participation in your study. And then also, I also, I imagine that, you know, for an alien study, your, your best bet is perhaps, or an interesting group would be uh, developing countries or people that aren't necessarily exposed as much to pop culture or science fiction in the first place. Cause I imagine then you get a, I'm not sure, I don't know what kind of response you'd get, but I think it'd be quite different than what you'd find in America or a, development, or a developed country. Yeah, uh, there's a few psychologists. I know the University of Pennsylvania has a team that works closely with the, with the Hadza tribe. Um, and so when you build up those really good relationships, like um, you can send psychologists out to do field work and run experiments in those communities, but it's, um, it's really tricky, it's really time consuming, it's really costly. Um, so when we think about social psychology and 
anthropology, which is a slightly related field, you know, we're both looking at culture, how people interact with one another. The difference is anthropologists typically go out and do field work, and that adds years to their training program, because you not only have to like start off by um, establishing those relationships, main, make sure you're maintaining proper ethics, like you're not influencing the culture in an undue way, um, and then you're also spending your summers going out to places that typically have limited access um, to the internet um, and the outside world so that you can interact with these communities for extended periods of time but they are so rich because they they are they think about things in such different ways and they also provide insight for how human ancestors may have um, operated and I mean that that's an interesting you're it's interesting that you mentioned ancestors because I was just going to talk about that it mm -hmm. seems to me that the experiment has already been run in some sense in that like 500 years ago when we well when europeans first started exploring the world they came across all these people who were still people they weren't green or anything but who were vastly different and in some sense the it well it didn't really go well for the people who we came across but um the the ex at least a part of the experiment seems to have been done because we see that some people were more accepting, some people were more hostile. So when you do experiments on finding aliens, do you ever look back and look at history and think, huh, that's interesting, this is how people interact? Or is that not really a part of your work? So I haven't done a ton of work on aliens yet. I'm hoping it's something we can dive back into as a lab um, in time. But I think it is important to look at the historical precedent, which is why I wanted to also minor in history at Michigan, because um, there's one author that I particularly, a psychologist and author that I really admire, Michelle Gelfand, who almost always starts her, her papers on culture with, here's what Herodotus thought about culture in ancient Greece. And I think starting things off with these historical anecdotes anecdotes is super powerful because you're saying not only can we observe this phenomenon happening right now but we can almost make a case that it's more so a part of human nature because we have all these examples from the past even going back to ancient greece of when people were doing this um so like finding meaning in the stars or this fascination with space that seems to be something that's built into the human condition because people from you know, since we started, since humans started documenting our lives, have been fascinated by stars and look up to the stars and write these stories. And the stories that they write are so heavily influenced by their culture. Um, so I think it's something that we have this innate curiosity about. Um, but when faced with the realities of those curiosities, I'm not sure, like aliens, I'm not sure it's going to go quite as well as we all want it to believe. I liken it to like, we're gonna have probably more of like a war of the world sort of reaction than we will Avengers. You know, like we're not all gonna team up together and then go fight space criminals. It's probably, you know, just not gonna go well at the end of the day. But that that's my prediction. I my my larger prediction is that we won't ever get to that point where we're interacting with aliens at all. Yeah, that that seems that seems very unlikely. But I mean, in the meantime, we have we have our own space travel, which we know that you also do work on. So what, what is that like? What, because I mean, especially with coronavirus, we all, we're all kind of being exposed to more isolation than we would like to, and to less, less opportunity for social interaction than we would like to and all of this stuff. So what kind of constraints does being alone in a metal box or a something box flying through space place on, place on people? What are the biggest things that you, you and your group end up studying? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, I think, is risk factors for things like depression and anxiety and a rise in negative emotions. Um, there hasn't been a ton of work, you know, about you rethink your position in the universe because you look back and you see the earth and you're like, wow, I am so small. That's not a super documented effect. Um, it's kind of it has this whimsical appeal to it, like it sounds like a really good story, but mostly you're, you're concerned about the fact that these are people that are highly dependent upon their technology and their crews back on Earth, so they're very dependent upon one another and people and things that they can't necessarily control. It creates issues of autonomy. They're isolated 
from their families and their support networks, um, even more so for thinking about Mars missions where you can have that delay of up to 45 minutes in communication. Um, and just all that really adds up to this, it's a really nasty recipe for depression and anxiety if, you know, you don't actively work to combat that, or if you don't naturally have this really, really strong sense of resiliency. But they try to pick astronauts who already are really strong in those areas, but nobody's invincible to that. But I mean, it's interesting that because I, we, I think anyone who's ever seen something on space flight will have seen any, will have seen something where they talk about that, whether it's in movies or in books or in papers or online. Everyone, a lot of people seem to be talking about what it's like being locked up in a metal box far away from everyone. But I mean, humans have done that for a really long time on boats, for example, you know, a couple hundred years ago, it was not uncommon for people to just get on a boat and leave and never be heard of again and never communicate with anyone else again. And they were incredibly lonely. So why is there a particular focus on space stuff? Whereas humans seem to have already been able to do it. But uh, to add to that, Joe, I'd also say like uh, with uh, exploring the oceans on boats, I think that there are still issues and not like there are tons of stories of trips to the Arctic or the Antarctic where like it didn't go well and there were mutinies and there were people that like, yeah, it was, wasn't so good for them psychologically. And so I'd say that it, it's still the same in trying to figure out how to best um, like create an environment, whether it be on a boat or in space on the International Space Station or in the future on Mars, an environment that kind of reminds them of home, but not enough uh, where they are so reminded of their responsibilities on their mission, I'd say. Yeah, I think there's two big factors. The first one being that humans are social creatures. Um, we have to interact with other people. It's just, like, even if you are the most introverted introvert, your body still is codependent upon other people, you know, making you laugh, making you cry, um, providing you the resources you need to survive. Um, and so when you're stuck with people, the same people, especially if you don't necessarily get along with them, or maybe they're from a different culture, so there's that cultural barrier that makes things even more difficult. The important differentiation between um, the, the shipping lanes that we saw, you know, from 1400 up until the present, that sort of trade and commerce is that space travel is infinitely more dangerous um, in terms of the risks that it poses. Um, so we define these environments as isolated, confined, extreme environments or ice environments. There are a few analogs. So an analog environment is anyone that you can say is, yeah, this is just about the same thing. So if we study it, the findings that we find in this place can transfer over to the findings in this place. Um, so naval submarines, um, aircraft carriers to a certain extent as well, because you know if you're actively in war, then you have that isolation, you have that confinement, and you have the extreme fact that you know your life is at risk. Um, Antarctica is another analog environment, especially scientists and researchers who are wintering over in Antarctica. And then there's actually a really interesting case that nursing homes might be an interesting analog environment to do because they are isolated, they are confined, and they're extreme in the sense that there is a risk of death inherent in nursing homes, especially with contagious diseases. But that's like a case one person made that I think is really compelling because I like the idea that old people are operating under the same psychology as astronauts. Something about that's really interesting <laughs> to me. Um, so yes, humans have been operating within extreme environments and isolated environments, um, but it does take a certain amount of mental substance to be able to do that. Um, and not everybody has that. And sometimes people end up in situations in which they aren't prepared for it and they think they are. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite space stories was the, the Skylab strike or mutiny or whatever you want to call it because they were under undue amounts of stress so um one of the astronauts on board said you know like we wouldn't be expected to work 16 hour days for like 84 days straight on earth so why are we being expected to do it in outer space where things are infinitely more stressful so they 
they just shut off comms and they just enjoyed themselves. Um, that, that's all they wanted was to have slightly more autonomy because they were so dependent on mission control at the time. So building up autonomy is another thing that is really important to consider in these environments. Like you need to have some control over your schedule. Some guy that you've never met in Houston can't dictate what you do every day in your life. That, that will drive you crazy, especially if you don't really have anyone to vent to about it. Yeah, the, the Skylab, I think it was the Skylab 4 mission was interesting, that story where they just had to take the day off. And also, I think the Skylab 3 members, when they like rotated uh, people or cosmonauts on the, on the space station, they actually left like dump, dead like dummies on board. So when the new cosmonauts came in, they thought like the old crew had died or like committed mutiny or something on board there. So there's that extra factor, psychological factor. <laughs> for that mission. Yeah, so they talk about humor a lot as a coping strategy with space flight. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons I really got into this is because I saw The Martian, and of course the main character in The Martian copes with everything with humor. And I thought that was so funny. And I just put myself in his shoes and I was like, if I was actually operating with this environment, would I cope with humor? The answer is probably not, because I've been living alone in this apartment for like four or five months now. And humor is not how I cope. I cope by, you know, talking to myself. Like I drop something on the floor and I'm like, oh, you dropped that. Um, so the fact that he uses humor is really interesting to me. But the kinds of humor that are used and acceptable are actually really interesting. So the cosmonauts operate on a completely different kind of humor than American astronauts do. And apparently it's caused some tension. Um, Collectively, they can agree that affiliative humor that kind of brings the group together is good. But other than that, they do kind of differ, which is interesting. Another reason, like another factor that goes into selecting astronauts is can you get along with people of different cultures as well? Because you're not just working um, with Americans, you are working with people from other cultures. And can you collaborate across those barriers? You want to instinctively be like, yeah, I totally could, but like, something as simple as humor. Can you think before you make a joke and make sure that your joke is going to be accessible to everybody on board? Like, I personally don't have the self-control to do that. And then, I've, oh, sorry, I've also heard that, um, for example, where, what, what kind of culture you grew up in will have a huge impact on how, how you deal with it. Because, for example, Americans are for the most part, more outgoing, I would say, than a lot of people. And things are pretty good over here. And so a lot of people are pretty happy and cheerful people. And, you know, if you say, how are you today? And someone says bad, that's considered rude for a lot of people. And you, ne you never hear that. Everyone is always okay, great, or awesome. But no one is bad. Whereas I've heard that, for example, in Russia, if someone says, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm fantastic. People are going to be, oh, that's strange. Where Because like, life is a lot harsher over there you know if you're cold at night the yeah, I would not be too happy if you're hungry at night i could and if you grew up like that i could see how you you would have a very different kind of coping strategy so are there that it's interesting to hear that for example if you were a russian astronaut on a mission with an american astronaut you might not go so well so do you think that the coping mechanisms for dealing with these kinds of environments would come from largely cultural things and you reminding people of their home? Or is it on the other hand, you have to train some behaviors out of people to make them feel better? I'm not sure that a lot of times you necessarily need to train people out of behaviors in part because of astronaut selection and cosmonaut selection, they typically come from military backgrounds. So NASA doesn't necessarily have to step in and be like, hey, make your bed in the morning because you can't just have the covers floating around in zero gravity. They are already have that sort of discipline. Um, and clashes typically are rare because they do carefully select people for certain personality types. Um, but as for what the cultural differences do, I'm not really sure. Um, why don't you rephrase your question for me real quick? Mm, yeah, so I was thinking what, you know, if you were, if you had, for example, let's say, let's say a Russian and, Amer and an American, would you try 
for to make them cope to make them get along better with each other would you have to try to make them both reach a uh, kind of a middle a middle point where you make both of them try to work together well to work in the same way as most as best as possible or would you on the other hand try to make the american you know as happy and as as american as he can be and the russian as happy and as russian as he can be and then no, it, it, that, get, that would get along yeah no it's about it's about coming to a middle ground um you need know, think about crew resource management which is a strategy used in um, in aviation um to resolve issues and differences um you in, in times of crisis, you do away with the titles and the rankings often. Um, if someone says, hey, there's something wrong, everybody stops and listens. It's not just, like, oh, you're the American, so you've invested more money in the ISS than Russia has, so we're just gonna automatically default to your settings. Everybody needs to give a little so that they can take a little bit back. Um, but again, these clashes are, are fairly uncommon. Um, and in a lot of the simulations they've done, like high seas, Russia also has like a isolated containment experiment where they lock people in a room. Those are all multicultural too. Um, and they've, they've had relative success. Um, a lot of it just comes down to the, like individual struggles, not necessarily struggles within the group. Like they cope and adapt to the problem differently, but that doesn't necessarily have downstream effects on team functioning as far as i'm aware yeah that, then, that makes a lot of sense uh like I've, compared to because when we think back on american space flight and americans going into space i think you know there's very few women that are going into space for the most part they're uh test pilots out of the military that are landing <laughs> on the moon or going to the international space station and then whereas when you compare that to russian space flight history i think Russia was the first uh, country to have a woman in space. And then historically speaking, over the decades um, into the present day, they always have, uh, they've always had like a couple of male cosmonauts, but also female cosmonauts. And so I was wondering, has this increased, uh, has there been studies about like, uh, like how teamwork changes and how the environment changes on board a space, um, on board the International, International Space Station changes? Because uh, are you, are you, better off having people of all the same background or is it best uh is it a better collaborate collaboration collaborating environment to have uh, more diverse backgrounds on board I'm, I'm searching right now i i don't know of any um studies off the top of my head that have looked at gender i'm sure people have because of that like what is the ideal like gender balance especially as we're thinking about trips to mars that are longer term mm -hmm. um i don't know precisely what the balance is there's a textbook um about the about space psychology and i know i know they touch on it um and so the gender differences are very interesting because men and women oftentimes resolve things very differently um and both have their strengths um, I think the Russian American difference has something more to do with um, the politics at the time of the space race, the fact that you know Russia was slightly Russia promoted slightly more equal rights for men and women because they were under a communist regime. That just kind of makes sense. Um, and the US still had plenty of gender-based discrimination alongside just you know a little dash of racism. Um, but there certainly are gender differences, but I think the gender differences that we see in the makeup of crews right now are based more so in historical and cultural factors, and they are intentional psychological choices okay. to maximize the efficiency of crews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, we've talked a lot about survive, surviving and kind of coping, but not so much about how you kind of maximize and extract the best performance out of crews and i would assume that those things kind of go together but also i there's i mean clearly companies and industry does a lot of research on how to put together the most efficient and effective teams and it's funny in the case of spaceflight for example i you can make a good case that
you should get all people from all the same background with all the exactly the same cultural stuff uh, and exactly the same kind of training because that means they'll all react in generally the same way, which can be, I, I, I assume that can be a, go, a good kind of crew reaction if when faced with a problem or when trying to do something, they all think and do the same. But on the other hand, if you're looking to get a solution that's not so obvious, you might want to have more diversity of thought and different kind of education and culture and things like that. Mm. So is that something that is that something that you that you look into in at your lab? Um, I don't. Um, but that diversity thing is really important because you wouldn't just put like a bunch of um, pilots on 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 a on a mission, you know? Like it, it kind of makes sense. You're like, okay, they're all going to be trained on how to do this. So if one fails, the other one can step up. They have sense of training and, you know, maybe we'll give them a little dash of training on these other things. Like we'll give this guy first aid certification just so we cover that base. But really when you have the diversity of background, diversity of thought, you have better problem solving skills and so this is something that's often studied by like HR and community psychologists that diversity, typically at the end of the day, if you have enough people that are, you know, open-minded and agreeable, you can overcome those differences that exist kind of on the surface and really tap into the deeper potential of those different backgrounds. That diversity thing is almost always a good thing as long as everybody is high in that openness and agreeableness. Mm. And I mean, the, which is, it, it's interesting that to compare the, um, the kind of the cultural aspect uh, but there is also definitely even within cultures for example if you're taking even a really small sample of americans if you take a kind of a scientist nerd kind of person not that all scientists are nerd nerds and you take it like a really cool like tom cruise top gun pilot kind of guy not that all pilots are that cool but if you they I mean, we know from movies and books and things like that, that those are not necessarily personality traits that get along very well. And for, and now, for example, we know that in space, we're going to, we're going to need more and more of a balance, or at least we're going to need some pilot people who are probably kind of cool. And we're going to need more scientists and they definitely have different backgrounds. So what, what kind of personality traits do like say would NASA select for? in a scientist, in a pilot, to try to get people to get on as best as possible? Yeah, so uh, psychologists often look at five personality traits. They're called the big five or ocean. So it's openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Um, and I think most of those are pretty self-explanatory, but the neuroticism one is it's almost similar to like anxiety levels. Like what level of anxiety are you operating at in general? So the two that NASA really selects for is they want people that are low on neuroticism. That makes sense. Um, and they need to be agreeable, you know, get along with people that are different from them. Um, and interestingly, they don't take people that are really high on extroversion. So like the Tom Cruise type, even, um, oh my gosh, what is that actor's name in The Martian? Matt Damon. Matt Damon. So Matt Damon's character in The Martian actually probably wouldn't be the best fit for being an astronaut because he is pretty high in extroversion. He does pretty well in the isolation though. I'll give him that, but that bubbly personality is not necessarily always the calmest personality. They typically need a lot of stimulation. They need a lot going on. And as stimulating as flying into space might be, it's those long time periods where nothing's going on or you're checking on how many millimeters your plant grew that day that doesn't offer that kind of stimulation that would be great. Um, but, you know, if they're looking for people that are level-headed, which is why they just naturally tap test pilots. In fact, the Mercury missions initially, you know, they were like, well, let's just open it up to the general public and maybe we'll let people that are really adventurous, you know, try out for the astronaut corps. And then they were like, no, we're going to just look at the test pilots for now. That drops them down to like 500 something people that are, that are eligible. And then they were like, okay, you need a college degree. Um, but one of the astronauts was able to like, you know, slide some money under the table um, and get away with that. I can't remember who it was. Um, so those are the personality traits they're looking for. They're looking for people that are also um, very, not, so they look for high in achievement and vitality. So vitality being slightly different from extroversion. Um, 
but yeah, people that really get value value achievement, value universalism, value security, and kind of have their own self direction. Um, yeah, so those are the kind of traits that they're looking for. Um, someone wrote like an expose in the 80s that basically pointed out, I just ordered this book on Amazon because um, when I was researching for this, it sounded super cool. She basically wrote this expose that was like, by the way, NASA isn't actually looking for specific personality traits. They're basically looking for feats of strength. And then after that, NASA started looking, spending a little bit more time looking at these personality traits, but the actual study of it didn't start really in earnest until about the 90s, kind of peaked in around 2000. And then we see this gradual decline in the amount that's being published and the amount it's being talked about as we see that kind of decline in NASA's funding. But I had the chance to talk to some psychologists at NASA. Um, there's, they've been super great and accommodating to talking to me about it. But again, it doesn't sound like it's something that NASA's pouring a ton of money and research into. Um, they're more interested in like human factor sort of things at the moment. Like how do we make the seat super ergonomic or how do we make this button like easy to press or like intuitive to press mm -hmm. in case of an emergency. So in that case, NASA right now is looking a lot at pilots and how pilots perform under stress and under pressure. The actual selection process, it doesn't sound like they're pouring as much money into it. It's mostly being done at the level of like universities that just happen to have professors who happen to be curious about this. And okay. do you think people are born that way or is that kind of a product of your environment? Because, and I know that's probably kind of a, no, there might not be a great scientific answer to it, but you know, for example, if you had, if you just took a random guy, person and you were wanting to say, make them a test pilot or make them an astronaut, would you have to, tr would you be able to train them, for example, to exhibit, to have, some of the better personality traits or is that something that you just kind of are and that is kind of invariant throughout your life and that, that reminds me of the i think it was a, also a movie but the right stuff and so they portrayed the the original mercury uh, uh seven astronauts including alan shepherd as like being born prepared to go to space being born ready to be a test pilot when they're like 20 years old and so is that yeah as joe asked is that something that you know right away or so personality is a mix of genes and environments. So some things are more heritable than others. Like think about neuroticism, for example. If you're high in anxiety, that probably stems from more of a neurochemical imbalance thing. That's hard to control. Um, and if there's any history of mental illness, I believe in the family, NASA just cuts you out um, because they don't want any chance of, even if you've never displayed symptoms or they don't want any chance of that popping up later in life um, or on a mission. Um, other things, slightly more malleable. So something like um, how much risk you're willing to take. So to a certain extent, astronauts have to lie in this middle of this like risk-taking spectrum where you have to be willing to get in a, a metal tin can that's going to rocket you into space but also you can't just untether yourself while you're in the middle of a spacewalk as cool as that might sound um but that particular factor um which i'll call you know sensation seeking because that's one of the things i like um to research so sensation seeking it's a largely based on your environment that you grew up in. There's a little bit of a genetic risk factor um, that has to do with like how your brain processes dopamine and serotonin. But for the large part, like if you grow up in an area where you can take a lot of risks, um, then you're going to be more inclined to continue doing those as long as it always pays off. As long as you always get a high um, from cliff diving and you don't end up actually dying from it, um, you're going to keep doing it because it's going to make you feel good. Um, so can you build an astronaut? Certain things, yes. But can I train, you know, someone to be an extrovert? No, not really. Can I train someone um, to want to get a college degree? Kind of. You can push them in that direction, but whether or not they succeed, that's largely based um, in something you can't control. But Yes, in terms of the Mercury 7 knew what they were doing and they were built for this, they probably were, you know, they probably 
you know, really worked hard in high school to get good grades so they could get to a good college, if they could get placed into the test pilot training program, they probably paid a lot of attention to their health because any little thing cuts you out of the test pilot program. Um, so a lot of these astronauts are really high in that achievement um, dimension, which is why NASA kind of naturally seeks them out because they know what they want. They're going to go after it. They're goal focused and they're going to stick to it. Um, and some of those other things like agreeableness that can kind of be taught, like you can kind of be taught to be a nicer person. Um, but again, they, they also just, the job calls for a certain kind of person. And so when someone applies to become an astronaut, um, how exactly does the process work? I imagine it's a very large pool of people that do apply. And then how do they begin to look at these psychological factors? Do they wait until they get to a smaller sample of people? And then they, do they start running tests? Or is it more based off of interviews, um, sitting down with the person and trying to understand them that way? Or is there more of a scientific approach where they're trying to quantify the person's psychology? So they have a semi-structured interview process, um, which basically means they have a set of questions that they are asking applicants. At what point in the process this takes place? I don't know, but I would imagine it happens much later in the process because, you know, the sort of interview can take hours to do. Um, so they start off and they go, well, why don't you tell me about your childhood? Tell me about your parents. And um, tell me a little bit about your personality. Maybe they have a few questionnaires that you fill out to kind of tap at that big five measure, quantify what the personality type is. Um, but they also want to hear more from you because that, in your own words, sometimes taps these things better than um, a test. Like one of the items on the sensation seeking measure that I talked about earlier was I like to go to parties. Like just because you like to go to parties doesn't mean that when you go to parties, you go crazy um, and go all out. You're not dancing on elevated surfaces. You might just like to, I, I like to go to um, my mother's tea party where we play bridge and eat tiny sandwiches. And that's not high in sensation seeking at all. So you also have to kind of get a sense from, of the person in that way. And then another thing that they do to kind of tap at these broader qualities of like leadership is they will you know, send them out on these backpacking adventures where you know nobody's really in charge but they have to survive and they see how you manage the stress in that way um they put you in positions where you are actually team leader now let's see how you lead people um, and so they're constantly under observation just because a task says hey the goal of today is to survive in the middle of a forest they're also tapping it like, okay, well, did this person survive, but they also snapped at a team member in the process in a way that was completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And so I also imagine that once you find your astronaut candidates to go up into space, wanting to become an astronaut, being accepted into the program is very different from actually being in space. And I imagine also your psychology changes once you go in that environment that maybe these tests can't really uh, look for or know about beforehand. And so I was wondering, because uh, I know how, or I guess the question is, how do they keep track and kind of study people's psychology throughout, say, their time on the International Space Station? Because there are a bunch of stories where it's, they were accepted into the astronaut corps, and it, you'd think that they'd be able to handle, say, 300 days or less on the International Space Station. But many of them came back, or there have been many, I think, uh, in the 80s or 90s, the Salyut mission where they had to end early because someone had uh, de uh, mild depression. And so how do you, how do they keep track of people and astronauts on board the International Space Station, making sure that they're in a healthy psychological state? Yeah, so there's been, there's been a lot of talk about how to do that and how to adapt methods that might work on the ISS or um, circumlunar missions, but won't work for Mars because you don't have that near instantaneous um, connection in terms of communication. A lot of these findings actually come from reading the diaries of astronauts. Um, I don't know if they're required to keep them, but I think a lot of them do if they're not required because the sample sizes are fairly significant, like you can get access to like 77 of these diaries at the very minimum um, of what I've seen. And so 
they keep diaries which can then be read by psychologists either in real time or after the fact. Um, there's been some talk of how to do um, psychotherapy. So basically, yeah, you'd have to check in with an actual therapist and talk about those things. Um, the latest I've seen on that um, is they talked about maybe doing like virtual reality thing for telehealth. Um, it's called Ansible. Um, so that I think will be something in the same way that they have to do medical checkups um, every once in a while, that you'll have to do these mental health check-ins as well. Um, and is, is someone who's studying psychology like you, are they, is everyone, or is the goal always, for example, to try to help astronauts, for example, when they're not feeling so great? And so, for example, is someone like you, for example, studying how to talk to people, how to help people and make them better? Or is it kind of studying how people will react under various circumstances without actually having to interact with them? Yeah, I think, so you're talking about how to differentiate between proactive and reactive care. So proactive in the sense that let's maybe put us, let's, let's cope with things as they happen rather than getting to the point where, yeah, you are depressed and we have to cancel the mission. Um, that's been a little bit of it. So a lot of the space psychology literature focuses on this coping, but it's a lot of retrospective stuff. It's not actual interventions that are really happening as much as it is. Um, this guy read a bunch of astronaut diaries and was like, this guy made a lot of jokes and he turned out okay. So we're gonna assume there's a correlation between that. We're also gonna assume it's causal. So let's just call it good. Rather than being like, all right, Michael's going up to the ISS, you have to do a bunch of jokes and your other guy is gonna do, not make any jokes and we're gonna see who turns out better at the end of it. Like that's not happening as much, again, because they're so rigorous in this testing process. I think they're almost assuming like, oh, they'll be okay because for every like one hour of actual space flight time, at least for the Skylab mission, they were doing like five hours of training before they even left the ground. Um, so if you want to spend 24 hours in space, you know, you're spending 125 hours just prepping to go into space. Mm, and um, yeah. the, 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 the training thing is really interesting because for sure, if you've been exposed to kind of a danger or risk or something stressful a hundred times before, you'll be a lot better at dealing with it and doing well under it um than if you hadn't ever before in the same way that and when you were talking about for example um the sensation seekers for people who've never surfed say a big wave i'm sure the first time must be unbelievable but by the time you've done a hundred and you've survived the 99 that could kill you before and you've done well the hundredth will be probably a lot easier so, it, it no longer gives you that wave of dopamine and serotonin that makes it so crazy and thrilling. It's almost like um, like drug use, you know? Like it takes a little bit more to get to that same high because you build up these tolerances to it. Your body does the same thing because in essence, any chemical drug is doing the same thing that your body would naturally do except for it's artificially doing it at way higher frequencies. Yeah, so for example, would, would someone who constantly takes the same kind of risk let's say a big wave surfer who is fully aware that the huge wave can kill them and that it's really dangerous but would would you say that someone who surfs big waves very often and a lot is a thrill would you is that a, does that make you a thrill seeker or does that make you just a calculated person who knows the risk they're taking or to be a real thrill seeker, would you have to be someone who one week goes and jumps off a really big cliff, the second week jumps off a plane, and the third week, you know, dives with some sharks? What, what, make, what makes you a thrill seeker? Yeah, what makes you a thrill seeker is doing those things repeatedly over time. Um, there's a difference between, you know, liking surfing and um, just actively seeking out those thrilling experiences. There's that there's some like old adage that like it's like if a guy writes you five sonnets he loves you but if he writes you 500 he loves sonnets um you know so that is, you have to differentiate between those things but um people that are high in sensation seeking that comes with a slew of other things that they tend to have um there's some research that notices that 
There's a correlation between being high in sensation seeking and liking punk music and reggae music, which is just, I don't know who was like, yeah, let's just spend a ton of time and research on this. Um, you are more likely to date people that um, fit like this dark triad personality traits. So that's being high on Machiavellianism, being like the ends justifies the means, being a narcissist um, and being psychopathic. So that's another warning sign. Um, and then things like drug use tends to be higher in people that are sensation seeking. So there's this whole slew of behaviors outside of just being like, I like going to parties and I like talking to people all the time and I like taking risks. There's a lot more to it. Um, but there's also good things that come along with sensation seeking. I'm an evolutionary psychologist, so I'm like, hey, if you're, if you're sensation seeking, you're probably going out and having unprotected sex, which is like a correlation that's been found that's great because it means you're having more kids. If you're taking more risks, you know, you're not only getting more feel good um, dopamine and serotonin, you're also more likely to stumble onto opportunities that can be good for you. Um, there are jobs that do require that you think thrill seeking. Um, like not many people are gonna wanna go be an astronaut. It does require a certain level of thrill seeking, but thrill seeking with someone who's also high in conscientiousness, who knows when to stop, um, when to take those calculated risks. And thing this conversation just reminds me of is, have you seen the crown yet season four no so prince philip meets with um the members of the mission that walked on the moon for the first time and he invites them out to buckingham palace and they're all sitting around and prince philip who was a fighter pilot in uh, world war ii is super excited to talk to these guys and like try to live vicariously through them and be like well what happened when you landed on the moon and the astronauts have no interest in talking about their experience on the moon because again they've been through these flight sims like how many times they've practiced this and they did it and they're like we don't really care they want to know about what it's like to be you know prince of england and live in buckingham palace and <laughs> that's probably just the reality for these people at the end of the day it is still a job is it one of the world's coolest jobs sure absolutely but you've done it so many times that by the time you get to space it probably has lost its thrill just a little bit yeah and i'd say also maybe that's related to why i think the average age of like a long duration iss astronaut is like 30 or 48 or 47 and so people are thrill seekers and they enter the astronaut core but they like become like they keep they continue to go into space and they become like controlled thrill seekers i guess it's a good way of phrasing it is controlled thrill seekers and so you talk you said that you were in evolutionary psychology well that you that you were into evolutionary psychology and that that made me think of the well it's an interesting thing. Well, it's odd to phrase, but so in psychology, it seems that lots of people are running experiments and are finding out like these little things, say, for example, people who are thrill seekers are more likely to be into reggae and punk music and things like that. And they're all, they're all interesting connections, but they're all kind of little add-ons. They're kind of like sticky patches. Does it, by being an evolutionary psychologist, are you trying to find what, like, tr I guess, what kind of really unifies, uh, kind of in the same way that in physics, you know, everyone, there's a, some people who are working on, you know, finding out how all these little effects work, but then you have people who are looking for the kind of the grand unified theory, the, the theory of everything. Is that something that's kind of coming along in psychology? Is are people looking for a theory of everything in the human brain or is, are we not at that stage yet? Yeah, that is a very good point. So doing more theory based work versus doing more experimental work. Um, the best papers out there are experiments that have been influenced by theory and contribute actively to, to the theory. It's hard because psychology has so many like little domains. Um, if you have clinical psychology that looks at psych like mental illness and um, psychopathy, and then you have um, social psychology, which is what I do, that kind of encompasses a bunch of little things like psychology, religion, cultural psychology. I think space psychology fits in there. You have like industrial organizational psychology, you have developmental psychology. I mean, the list goes 
on and on. So it's hard to find a single theory that can weave a web through fields that should probably almost be different departments if we think about this and the way academia does. But, you know, you look at human behavior and you're just kind of shoved into a, a box. Um, but evolutionary theory is one theory that you can use to kind of frame human behavior in the same way that, you know, some clinical psychologists might use Freud as here's this, um, here's this theory that we can use to influence how we view the world. It's like a lens for viewing the world. Evolutionary theory is nice because it's so zoomed out. It looks at um, so many different things across the whole, um, whole development of human, humans as a species, which is what I think is so cool about it. Um, it's explaining processes and things we see today by things that our ancestors faced years ago. Um, so a lot of the work I did in undergrad looked at how disease um, avoidance, like how we have this natural fear of diseases influences behavior today. Um, evolutionary psychology is great for, for the kind of work that I do, looking at culture, looking at how people interact, how it relates to space psychology is something I've been working on trying to connect so that I can make a case for why we should all be paying a ton of attention to it and why, um, you know, parts of my PhD program should be looking at it. Um, but the, it's kind of hard to make that case, um, but we'll see. One of the things I think is interesting is, you know, population density is a factor that we look at when we're talking about um, the sort of environments that we operate within. And it, it sounds almost kind of backwards, but like things like the ISS are really high in population density because you have you know, six to 10 people living in this really, really confined space. It's isolated, but it's really high population density. And so maybe we can use some of the findings we know about population density um, and how that affects um, our psychology and use that to influence some of the space psychology work. So I think that would be a really cool intersection that I don't think anybody's gotten there yet. I mean, it, it's interesting because with coronavirus especially, I, I, it seems to me like a lot more people are becoming aware of their own psychology and they're not just waking up and going to work and talking to such and such people and more and more people are thinking, huh, this is weird. Why do I do this? And why do I think that? And especially with people being a lot more lonely, I've, you know, I've heard quite a, f and more and more, I, I, I've been hearing these arguments that, oh, you are feeling this way because your body evolved to counter this. And for example, with loneliness, people, you know, people say, oh, you don't like being, you actively dislike being lonely and it makes you really stressed because back in the days, if you were like back in the days, if you were alone, you were going to get eaten or crushed by a mammoth or something. Mm. Yeah. That, that's an awesome point. Yeah. One of the things um, the advisor I had at Michigan was on the news talking about how some of these evolved disease avoidance mechanisms we have can oftentimes result in prejudice, which is why we saw potentially a rise in prejudice in response to COVID. You know, we wanted somebody to blame it on. Unfortunately, it happened that the disease originated in China, so that was a natural target. So that's why we saw a rise in um, anti-Asian prejudice. Um, in, in the month or so immediately following um, the quarantine period. Um, and that's something actually um, my, my department has a grant from the NSF to be looking at as prejudice in response to coronavirus. And it has some interesting results that I don't think I can talk about until they're publishable and peer reviewed. And I mean, it, yeah, it, it is strange that but on the other hand, we're encountering a lot more kind of new stresses that we didn't use, that we never used to run into. For sure, for example, um, you know, with with space flight, it's a unique constraint. But for example, with staring at a screen all day and then these kinds of things, they're a lot newer. And for some reason, sometimes our bodies are are kind of using an all. You know, people talk about how we've inherited all of these responses and all of these thoughts and all of these features from what our ancestors went through and it's funny to see that our body is sometimes misusing a response that it learned in the past to a new situation not to our advantage but precisely to our disadvantage is it for example could we for example learn how to change our response is that something that psychologists are trying to figure out for us that 
how we can, instead of using the old inappropriate psychological response, we can learn how to adapt to a new one? Or is that just an inbuilt flaw of the human brain and it's over and done and we're just going to have to live with that? No, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, it's called, so what you're talking about is called evolutionary mismatch. So we have this evolved behavior mechanism that no longer matches the environment that we're operating in. Um, so there's been a, there have been some people that have made the case that um, mental, so things like ADHD and OCD used to be really beneficial in the past because to be hyper attentive to your environment might have been a really good thing in the ancestral past or having these little rituals um, that keep you safe would have been a good thing. But in today's environment, they're no longer adaptive because we just frankly don't face as many threats. Um, but then you get people that read these articles about how prejudice might be an evolved response. I'm not taking an issue, I'm not taking a standpoint on that issue, but they read, you know, that here's this thing that exists and they think, oh, that's a justification for it. So it's okay if I'm racist because it's an evolved mechanism. And that's something called the naturalistic fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. Just because something is something doesn't mean it has to be that way. Like you can actively work to unlearn um, the immediate reactions you have. It's something um, clinical psychologists use all the time in therapy. Um, you learn, you have a phobia of heights. That's something natural. Like we should have evolved to have a fear of heights. Um, that's perfectly that's perfectly rational. But if it becomes, if it gets to a point where it becomes irrational, then there are steps you can take to unlearn those fear, fears. But you have to be willing to put in the effort to change those reactions. And some people just frankly don't want to or don't have the mental time or energy to unlearn those things. But absolutely, it's possible. Um, you know, there's that saying that your first response isn't your response. It's your brain's immediate response, but that doesn't mean it has to be your response. You're responsible for what you, what you do in that second moment that you're thinking about a decision. That's who you really are. It's the decision you make, hey, I'm gonna make this hateful statement. No, like take a step back and wait a second and think about it. And then whatever you decide to do, that's more reflective of your character than that impulsive thought you immediately have. Hmm. Yeah, that, that is interesting because for sure now I, I often find myself wanting to punch the hell out of my computer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do it. Um, and I, I mean, that doesn't really last for a very long time because if I did punch my computer, nothing would change. And I would still have the same assignments except that now I would have to schlep all the way to the Apple store and get a new one and get it fixed and tell them, hey, I need a new computer. And they'll say, well, you smashed it, so you have to buy a new one. And I would be all mad. So that would be, that would be a bummer. Mm. You need but, like a Zoom warranty program that's like, if you have any accidents related to frustration due to Zoom, it's covered. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be very cool. Mm. But yeah, it, it, it is very strange to see how Thing, how we're how we're moving along and adapting to to the new kind of constraints on our life and so for I was thinking a lot of it come and you know if you watch sports for example people will you often hear the commentators talk about how a certain team that's succeeded or sometimes the teams that fail miserably kind of build a, a certain kind of culture and so I was I was thinking about kind of how people make cultures because we can I you know we've and we've all we've been talking for, about cultures for quite a while and all of it are kind of like inherited they're not our making they're what you inherit from your past and your ancestors are you or are people what are you or are other people looking into how for example we can make a, a or create a culture specifically for example maybe in space flight but then how that could adapt back to just regular people or is that something that people assume is just a learned behavior and is never going away no you you learn culture so culture kind of has this a uh, cool circular effect where you influence culture because you actively participate in it, but it also influences you. So think of any slang word that's come into existence. So let's use YOLO because that's what's coming into my mind. Somebody had to 
to first come up with that acronym that you know ruined our middle school careers um and they had that influence on culture and then because you use that word and you put it in an instagram caption you had this further influence on culture and then it's just like this wheel of things that influence one another um the origins of culture is something i think is super interesting one of the things you know like um, if ethics or money wasn't an issue, um, I would love to put a bunch of babies in, you know, a massive container that's self-contained and see how their culture forms. Um, like, how do they decide to communicate with each other? We could watch the birth of language. We could watch the birth of cultural products and this cultural identity. Um, something as simple as, do they use last names or not? You know, because that actually differs from culture to culture. Uh, that was one of the things I worked on in undergrad was learning about last names across different cultures. It's a pain. Um, <laughs> everybody does it differently. Um, but then also everyone has similar similarities in that I think everyone has a name. I, I never heard of any where anywhere in the world where they just refer to someone as hey you. Yeah, no, I mean like even in sign language, um, that's something that they develop is like a, a unique sign um, to indicate your name. You don't just always finger spell your, your name. Um, you can get a unique sign that um, at least within the culture of ASL has to be assigned to you by someone who's actually typically deaf, um, which I, I just think ASL is a whole other conversation about like a really unique culture. Um, one of the things one of my advisors um, really advocates is, for, is that there are many different forms of culture. You know, it's not just um, culture as we think about it. Um, you know, I'm an American, I'm a woman, um, I'm a student at ASU, I was a student at Michigan, and those are all uni unique little cultural identities, and we can measure those the same way that we measure culture on a scale of individualism to collectivism, and there's a bunch of other markers that I won't go into, um, but that our cultural identities are also unique, and I think one of the things that astronauts in particular can really bond over is um, almost a shared sense of trauma. Like we're all about to embark on this adventure. We all have roughly the same personality types. A lot of us have that military background and military culture is a very specific kind of culture and they, it's very strong. It's an incredibly strong bond. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they can bond on that, but it's gotta be like such an interesting dynamic within not even within the astronaut corps, but like within a specific mission group, how tight you must have to be, um, while also maintaining a sense of hopefully individuality. Um, and then you have to come back to a world that has never looked at Earth from an outside perspective. And how do you um, reintegrate within that mm. separate culture? Um, and I think it's super interesting. Yeah, we've spent a good part of the beginning talking about like specifically like low earth orbit ISS astronauts. But I think moving forwards, like trying to think of uh, how astronauts would cope on say the Mars or the a moon mission where they have to stay there for longer periods of time. And where I don't remember in the beginning, you mentioned uh, like an international space station, you're outside of earth, you're looking at it from that perspective, but you're still looking at your home where you grew up, like where your family is. Um, but when you're on the Mar when you're on say Mars, it's just a distant dot in the sky. And so, how does your psychology change uh, when you're you're moving further and further away? And then coming back as well, because you must love then you have to, be, to do some crazy things when you're all alone. Mm -hmm. We're in a really tight group, and then you come back, and the world is not is not what it was quite different. Because because imagine say a hundred years from now, uh, some Mars colony, and a child's born on Mars, but say they want to travel home to visit Earth. Then how would Earth people or Earth humans perceive uh, people coming from Mars. Mm -hmm. Interest. Yeah, I, I imagine they'll be perceived as someone coming from a different country, almost just slightly more like exotic. Like I've never met someone from Latvia. That if I did, I'd be like, oh my gosh, what is Latvia like? Because I have no idea. But if I meet someone. Um, from Canada, I'm like, oh, Canada, like I lived not too far from there. That's cool. I can basically <laughs> infer everything I need to know about that. But Latvia, like, what is, where even is Latvia? <laughs> um, as for like the difference between Mars um, 
the ISS and system missions, there's a really great paper. If you want like a great overview of what space psychology looks like as a field right now, especially long duration space missions, there's a paper in American Psychologist, which is one of the top papers in psychology. Um, it's Landon et al. 2018. Um, and they have a table in here where they compare um, the three different kinds of missions. And I mean, they really couldn't be more different. Um, basically, on every single dimension, they're going to be different. The only thing is that the only comparable thing on here is that cislunar missions and Mars missions will both have crews of about four people. In terms of everything else, distance from Earth, how long it takes to get back, the size of the vehicle, whether or not a resupply is possible, the communication delay, um, like those are all going to be completely different. So everything I say from here on out is going to be conjecture. In terms of the actual psychological effects, I think really what they need to be most concerned about um, is depression and anxiety um, because they will be away from home for longer than anybody will have been because Mark Kelly was the longest astronaut in space, if I call, recall correctly. The longest U.S., yeah. U.S., yeah, and even the longest not U.S. is not even two years, but a Mars mission will be two to three years at the minimum mm -hmm. um, round trip. So what effect will it have? Like, I don't know. I honestly think, again, that we might romanticize this idea of seeing Earth from a distance for the first time or not seeing Earth. Um, the people they're picking are incredibly resilient. So will it be, you know, this gorgeous view? Yes. Will they probably be like my dad driving through the Grand Canyon? You know, where he's like, wow, look at that. And you're like, it's the same rock. We like, it looks the same. There's nothing there. It's just a bunch of stars. Like, there's nothing incredible about it once you've seen it once. Like they will probably have you know, the stereotypical suburban dad reaction to any national park. Like, will it, will it, you know, cause them to rethink their entire existence in the universe? The data says no. They typically don't come back to Earth and then decide to embrace religion or abandon religion. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just the wear and tear of being alone and in an environment that's fairly high stress. Because I mean, you know, if anything hits the ISS while it's in motion, like it can puncture a hole in it that can kill everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the radiation that you, so even once you return to earth, um, you could return not only with like being shorter because of lack of gravity, but you can you have, um, other effects on your body. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the insurance insurance covers that astronauts do before the yeah so this is really interesting. I just learned about this the other day where the rumor is that they started doing these insurance covers because nobody would insure the astronauts with life insurance before they went up into space and so then astronauts would be stressed so they would basically when they're sitting in pre-flight quarantine sign a bunch of pieces of paper as almost insurance so that they could be sold on the chance that they die to collectors and that's how their family will be insured for the rest of their life that's how they'll make an income astronauts can actually be insured it's just that nasa cannot pay for that life insurance and that's how the whole rumor got started but that itself has to have a psychological effect on you like just even before you get up into space, knowing that you could die at any moment, mm -hmm. that does start, that does have a delir I don't even know what that word is. That can have a negative effect uh, on the mind. The fact that here's this ritual that all astronauts do when we sit alone in quarantine for 14 days, we sign a bunch of pieces of paper so that if we die, people can buy our autograph at a higher price because we are dead. Mm -hmm. You can still collect them now though, mm -hmm. even yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to know like what that balance is for astronauts, like in terms of whether or not I'm going to blow up, or that that worry, or uh, the the concern and the stress over the the need to perform at a high level because they're 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 supposed to conduct these experiments and have six hours of sleep and follow this very strict schedule every time. Because I know there's I don't remember the exact astronaut that said it, but there's a quote that says astro from an astronaut says astronauts aren't worried about blowing up; they're worried about messing up. Um, yeah, I think that's that exactly it. Um, you always, I mean, it's it's the mission first. Um, it's this very military mindset. Um, mm -hmm. 
that you just need to keep going in spite of everything and that if you have any sort of mental distractions like that um it, it's just it's just a distraction so um this is kind of morbid but submariners who are on extended missions they only get email transmissions like every so often you know it's not like you can email their gmail account and expect to get a response from them um and so all of their emails and communication with family members are scanned before they're forwarded on to the crew members. So there is an actual person on board who censors all communication. Um, and one of the things they'll censor is if any sort of loved one has passed away, you don't find out until you've reached port again. And that's the kind of thing I think you can expect from um, these Mars missions. Um, if your grandmother dies when you are 10 days into a three-year mission, like, I don't think NASA's going to tell you, um, unfortunately, yeah. but, because but, any sort of hiccup is going to be bad. But if it's, I suppose, your grandmother, you, you don't talk to every day. But I know for at least astronauts on the ISS, they talk to their, usually their family and their wives or husbands every single day. And so, like, so someone closer than say their grandmother passed away then I, i'm curious to know what the implications for that would be for a mission i would i would be too and also the ethical considerations like how much of your life can nasa control i i, I really wonder what those contracts say um but again the further you get from earth the more mission control has power over that that line of communication um it's a little bit harder to censor when you're talking in real time, like astronauts mm -hmm. do on the ISS, mm -hmm. um, than it is opposed to like, there's a 45 minute delay, they're definitely going to censor everything. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the ISS is slightly less high stakes. Um, you can't just come and go as you please, but it, it's only a few hours to get home as it is opposed to months. Mm -hmm. um, and this is somewhat related since it's on Mars, but I was wondering what your your thoughts were on, I think it was called the Mars One mission, where I think it went bankrupt a few years ago, but basically the, the premise is for people to sign up from the public or astronauts and they go to Mars, but it's a one-way ticket to Mars. And so they're going to stay and live out the rest of their lives on Mars. And like, how does, because that's psychologically, that's completely different than what an astronaut's dream to do, where they, there's like a reward afterwards after say 300, 500 days where they're going to come back to earth and see their family and see the, the environment they grew up in. In some ways it has its pros and its cons, you know, um, maybe, maybe they have a different mindset. Like if they're going to establish a new home, like maybe that's a good thing, but I think, I think NASA is wary of sending people into space that have no ties back to earth. That almost that in a way that that's a bad idea, right? Like you don't send the guy who has no family up into space because he has less reason to come back down. Mm -hmm. um, but you also don't want the guy who's like, I could never leave my family. He wouldn't sign up for the astronaut corps in the first place. But you know, th there's a balance between that. So I, I would be hesitant. One of you know private firms just sending people up into space. I hate to give to NASA, but the idea of recruiting from the military is a pretty wise idea, especially in the current um, state of space travel. If we were, you know, actually building colonies, that's when you can start to send, you know, the average Joe up or like when they were like, yeah, let's send Big Bird up into space, you know, for the, for the press. Um, that, that makes slightly more sense, but for these high stakes missions, especially Mars, the average Joe probably shouldn't be going to space. I imagine it would be a rigorous selection process, um, but like NASA decided with the Mercury mission, the guy that goes rock climbing is drastically different from the guy um, who's flying supersonic jets. Um, that would be my hot take on Mars one. I haven't heard about that one. And so I was thinking as an, as an interesting sort of kind of segue out of this conversation um because we have been talking for quite a while what kinds of things would you expect to, ch to change or to happen differently if for example people do end up living in a colony on mars but they're they're still pretty far away from earth but they're you know they're not entirely how how do you think they would 
manage their culture? How do you think their culture would evolve differently, say, if they were in a, in a completely different setting because they're not on earth? What, what kind of changes do you think that would, that would cause people to have? And what kind of cultural behaviors do you think would have to go or come? Because you, you mentioned that the perfect test bed environment would be like babies, babies you how their culture, how the how their culture forms, and I guess Mars is uh, like the second best opportunity to see how that forms. Yeah. So one of my favorite shows, actually, I just have to put a plug for this. It's called Ascension. It was on Sci-Fi. It's like six episodes um, where they basically. I, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, it, it's like watching the culture of um, of a bunch of people in a spaceship colony evolve. Um, and so that's really interesting, but actually evolutionary psychology can give us a lot of cool insights because there's a few things we can basically assume about Mars. Besides being isolated, confined, and extreme, it's gonna be a really harsh environment where there isn't a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of resources available. It's probably gonna be high mortality, but if they do it correctly, it'll be low in, pathogen prevalence. Um, in theory, not many diseases should just spring up out of nowhere. But um, what those harsh environments tend to do is they tend to create cultures that have really strict norms and really strict punishments um, because you have to keep people in line somehow. So um, you think about so America's a pretty loose culture. Um, so but the Wild people, West in in movies at least wasn't you know the the judge was pretty quick-handed and the hangman was too exactly he, um justice is dealt swiftly and it's dealt pretty harshly because you can't go running around all crazy because we're the only people out here um we'll see probably really stable and strong bonds because um i can't just get in petty fights with people because they're the only people here and I need to maintain those strong coalitional ties. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we see in harsh environments? Um, yeah, I, but a lot of collectivism. So there's not going to be a ton of room for the free individual spirit. So even if, you know, they do develop their own pop culture on Mars, the extent to which um, band t-shirts and crazy tattoos and body modifications and individuality is expressed, probably not going to be a thing. Um, because again, it's better to think about how will my actions impact the group than it is to think about how the group more so will affect me. Do I need to stand out from the group? The answer is probably no. Also, probably if it plays out like any sci-fi movie ever, they're all going to wear the same gray sweat jumpsuit um, it, it would be interesting because it would kind of be a a, f a unique fresh start for humans because at, everything that we do now feels tainted by the past whatever we do wherever we are whatever we own it's all kind of come to us from the past and we're just doing it different with a twist whereas over there it would kind of really be a a new start especially that they would start from so small now you know i was born and I was born wherever I was born, and that was really far away from people who were born, say, in China, or people who were born in Africa or South America. Whereas, if everyone is born in the same bubble, that would definitely that would be a that would be a just a crazy kind of thing because they would have no one, I guess, culturally different to interact with. They would all be interacting with their with their own, which is kind of like what humans used to be doing before we discover how to travel quickly and i mean from there you can you can infer that maybe people maybe there will be like this intense earth mars rivalry um because they they won't interact with one another as much you know maybe we'll get some cool bbc documentary on like what life is like on mars and then we'll be like wow how exotic um, <laughs> but or you, you know, can imagine a skylab 4 mission like playing out on Mars where they cut off communication with Earth because they're sick of Houston telling them what to do all day. Yeah, eventually they're going to develop their own autonomy. Um, when that's going to happen, I have no idea. Um, I have no predictions. It seems like it keeps getting pushed back. <laughs> yeah. But NASA, if you're listening, I would love to be a part of any selection crew. I have no real qualifications yet. But, I have but one passion. day. 
Yeah, one day, hopefully. Yeah, if everything keeps going well, that would be cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Yeah, thank you, Alex. That was awesome. The opportunity to nerd out. I, I love this stuff. I wish I got to spend more of my day on it. So this is nice. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. This is Michael. This is Sam. This is Tommy. And this is Joe. If you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to leave a review. All of the show notes can be found either in the description below or on our website. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week with more Everything Astronomy.